Calvin Booth had himself some comments. He 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 spat some fire to the ringer. We're gonna talk about his comments. What does it take to build a dynasty? Is MPJ a me first player and more? All that on today's locked on nuggets. You are locked on nuggets, your daily Denver Nuggets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Nuggets, your daily Denver Nuggets podcast, part of the Locked On Network, your team every day. Thanks for joining us, making us part of your day. Appreciate you guys being with us each and every day and being an everydayer. We're glad to have you part of our community. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. Joined by my co-host Swipa. You can follow him on Twitter at Swipa Cam. And we have a lot to talk about today uh, because Calvin Booth spoke with the ringer, as did Tommy Balchettis and several members of the Nuggets, uh, in a long feature written by Kevin O'Connor about their plan to build a dynasty. And there's a lot to kind of break down in it, and we'll get all to it. But first, Swipe, uh, how you doing, my man? Uh, it's been a really good day. A lot of exciting material happening around the NBA and the different Nuggets right now, so I can't wait to get into the conversation. Yeah, we are uh, we are a week, a week in a week. The banner drops just as we're as as a heads up as you're listening to this on Tuesday. Uh, banner drops on a week from to, from today when this episode goes live on the old podcast. Um, so we'll start with a talk about Calvin Booth's ideas on the dynasty. And yeah, if you haven't read it, we'll we'll put it in the uh, it's on Twitter. We'll put it in the uh, descript episode description. Great article from KOC breaking down everything about how they've kind of approached the look at this team. Uh, the biggest thing is that it kind of talks about the, the about Booth's entire process of looking at wanting to build um, the team with young talent. And it doesn't necessarily take on uh, my kind of approach to it, which is like, hey, it does to a certain degree. It says the rookies are all cost effective. Uh, and that matters because you can get them under cost controlled value in the new CBA. These contracts are just going to be really valuable and you're seeing more and more restrictive elements put in place. And we're kind of seeing this divergence. I talked a little bit about this on locked on NBA of there's kind of two ways to build a, a contender right now. You can have multiple stars and then a bunch of veteran guys that are really at the end of their rope, like, the Bucks did with Wes Matthews and Joe Ingles, guys that are injured and at the end of their careers. Like they had two guys on their staff on their roster who had Achilles tears. It's really kind of wild. Um, or you can go the Nuggets route, which is you have multiple stars and then you fill that roster out with young guys. That's what they're attempting to kind of build on this year. Um, there's a lot more, I think, things to get into in terms of the individual comments that he made about specific players and a lot of things that I kind of cocked my head at. But the big thing here uh, kind of gets in the last second to last paragraph, which is I just want dudes that we try to develop and it's sustainable, Booth said. If it costs yeah. us a chance to win a championship this year, so be it. It's worth the investment. It's more about winning three out of six, three out of seven, four out of eight than it is about trying to go back to back. So this kind of goes back to a very Spursian approach of let's be in the conversation in as many seasons as possible. And if you always have a chance because you have Nicola, then opening the window as wide as possible takes the precedent over pushing as hard as you can for an individual season. What was kind of your reaction to that side of the comments? Yeah, I think it was interesting how we talked about not wanting to pigeonhole the roster when you have a veteran led roster where you have a bunch of players or one year of rental, very short term deals that you can only really focus on one singular year in terms of repeating chasing the individual championship. Now, what I do love is that in this article, Calvin Booth talks about the philosophy that he has that's built on four key pillars, as Kevin O'Connor talks about. And the pillars are basketball IQ, character, positional size, and the absence of skill deficiencies. And trying to find players that fit at least three of those criteria, if not all four. And what he talks about, too, is not having skill overlap. So it's so funny because if you look at Jamal Murray, KCP, MPJ, AG, 
Jokic, Christian, Peyton. You look at Julian Strother, Jalen Pickett, Hunter Tyson. They all have individual skill sets that are supposed to complement the whole. Jokic passing, playmaking, and allowing him to have enough room to be able to score when it time comes. Jamal Murray, ISO, pick and roll post game, making sure he can be an off ball threat. Michael Porter Jr., one of the best spot up shooters in the NBA, if not the very best, great cutter, can get to the rim, create opportunities for himself. Everybody has something they do really well at a really high level. And so the roster is so intentionally built to make sure that everybody complements the other. And I think him bringing that philosophy up, as well as the comments that you brought up about, we don't want to just be winning today, but we want to be in the conversation and we want to be at the very top of who can win the championship for the next eight seasons, even, and winning four of the next eight is really important. I think it shows a long-term view with this process that even now, Matt, if we look at drafting all the young guys and, you know, Matt, I remember, you know, when you used to talk sometimes about having young guys on the roster and what it doesn't sometimes allow for you to do because you've got to invest in a bowl bowls or maybe even the MPJ. This is a different kind of youth. All these dudes have been in the system for three years. They have contributed to winning situations, whether it be a Gonzaga or Kansas, or they've gone through the entire program like Hunter Tyson at Clemson. And it's allowed for them to have mature games at 23 years old. And so what's so special about what they're doing is putting young players in a position to be successful by allowing them to be themselves, but also to ingratiate them into a championship culture and championship system around a core four, especially that have been here for a number of years that have already won a championship. And again, being willing to sacrifice winning one championship, meaning maybe this year you don't get it done because the young guys are still coming along. But the good news is, is you have so many young guys that are in the system buying in and believing in the culture and their place in that culture that for years to come, you're able to build on their expanding skill set and the confidence that they grow within the Denver Nuggets culture. So I think that was my big takeaway, is that there's an overarching plan and it's a commitment to a long-term vision. Yeah, I, I think so. It's it's good. I think it's good to have all those things. I, I there's part of me that's like, how is this an, entirely different from Warriors two timelines? And like the answer to that is kind of wrapped in you one that you know, the Nuggets prime is younger, right? They're mm -hmm. in their absolute primes, entering it now at 28, 29 um, versus the Warriors who are at the already past that prime and into their late prime slash early decline age 33, 34. That's like a, a primary starting point for the differences. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting here is that he talks about how he doesn't want overlap. Like he doesn't want overlapping strengths and he doesn't want overlapping weaknesses. He talks about the Lob City Clippers, Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan both helped define that team, but they lacked the ability to space the floor and neither was a great perimeter defender. Uh, JJ Redick and Chris Paul had too much overlap. They had the requisite yeah. skills for the position, but both were kind of undersized. And that kind of helps explain a little bit of how this roster is built, where you almost have kind of the spectrum of forwards, right? Where it goes from um, a guy like Julian Strother to a guy like MPJ to a guy like Peyton Watson to a guy like Aaron Gordon. Like there's a spectrum there of, of forwards that all kind of operate. And you can put Christian Brown probably in somewhere in that as well, as far as on the wing um, that, that kind of fits in that. And they don't necessarily all do the same things. They do different things in different ways. And that makes sense. I think one of my concerns as it continues to be is one of the values of redundancy is your ability to manage injury is that mm -hmm. if KCP's out, you do have, you know, if Christian can shoot better, you've got Christian for the defense and shooting and you've got Julian Strother for the shooting and, and maybe defense. And so you have some redundancy there, but I worry that as we get and kind of get into the forwards, you start to get it too far away from what you want to be able to do um, or just like base level efficiency. Um, and I do kind of wonder if there's a reason that so many teams wind up having to kind of go in. Like there's the real benefit here is that the Bucks in particular ran up against a situation where like they had to pull off the Dame trade in, in part because Giannis was getting frustrated. And one of the reasons Giannis was getting frustrated is like they didn't have the capacity to improve. Like they had to trade you holiday because that was their only means of being able to make a, a meaningful impact move because they trade all their picks to get drew. And if you're mm -hmm. constantly in debt 
And the Heat, to be honest, the Heat kind of found this out with Dame, right? If you're constantly in debt in terms of your assets, of your young players and picks, it's hard for you to put together trade packages for the improvements that you need to build around these guys because that the Nuggets are want to develop their young guys and keep them cost-controlled. But if there comes a point where they're like, we need something else or there's an injury, we've got to get reinforcement, these guys can also help to work in those deals as well. It gives you that flexibility. Yeah, and again, I think that obviously replacing MPJ AG, especially a six foot ten sharp shooting wing, and then AG, one of the best two way forwards in the NBA. You're not going to be able to do that, but I think again, having the access to Hunter Tyson, Peyton Watson, even Justin Holiday, there are players that can give you something that resemble what you would like to have. And you know what was great was that when he talked about even the importance of having wings on the roster, and that way. You're even in, as we're going to get to comments about Peyton Watson later, is that right now, Calvin Booth, they're so sure their offense, their offense is always going to be elite. It's always going to be at the top of the NBA. But now it's just about how do we make sure that the defense is there to supplement that offense and make sure that we have the players that can perform up to that level when we need them to, and especially to be able to be role players that can excel in their roles defensively as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think, and now with the new CBA and especially, you know, where we're headed with the second April with this Denver Nuggets squad at some point in time, it's just it has to be done this way. At least it feels like it matter has to be done this way where you're going after young talent to try to build around the rest of the guys on the roster that are pay, getting paid big money. On the other side, Calvin Booth in this article had some comments about Michael Porter Jr. and Bones Highland that are definitely worth their own segment. We'll dive into that and deconstruct that a little bit on the other side. Right now, I need to tell you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp, is, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Uh, BetterHelp is online therapy that is going to help put you in the best position possible so that your brain doesn't get in the way of you being your best self. Uh, a lot of the times when I'm under stress and something is bothering me, it gets in the way of things in my life. I'm not as productive as I want to be. I'm not as clear headed as I want to be. I'm not as present with my family and friends as I want to be. And you want to be at your best. and that's part of this therapy is doing the work to put yourself in the best place to be healthy and to do the things that you want to do the best that you can if you're thinking of starting therapy give better help a try it's entirely online designed to be convenient flexible and suited to your schedule just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge make your brain your friend with better help Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. We'll be right back on Locked On Nuggets. Back here on Locked On Nuggets, thanks for joining us, making this part of your day. Appreciate you guys being with us. If you haven't yet, go give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if that's where you listen. Or if you're one of our YouTube fans, give us a, give us a like. Give us a like and a subscribe to make sure – uh, that you're supporting the show the best way that you can. So continuing our conversation on the Kevin O'Connor article about the Denver Nuggets and particularly uh, GM Calvin Booth, the comments were really interesting because here's the whole section I'll read. Um, it talks about the players that they need to go after. And then KOC mentions who to get rid of. Uh, one of Booth's first moves, according to KOC, was a Trey Bones Highland, a young bucket getting guard who came off the bench, but didn't offer a lot other than scoring. Despite being so young and showing promise, Highland was dealt for just two second round picks. The Nuggets didn't want much of the same, too much of the same thing on their team. And here's Booth's comments. I knew you couldn't have two guys that couldn't guard and we couldn't have two guys that were young and kind of more, quote, knee guys. He goes on to say, Mike makes 30 million. He's one of the best shooters in the NBA. So Bones, there's no place for you. Um, I will go second. <laughs> I will let you go first because I think you have a, a very positive approach. Uh, what was your reaction when you read that particular section? Look, I'm not saying it's positive. I think when I first read it, I remembered – where the Nuggets were when Bones Highland was still in the roster when he was considering Michael Porter Jr. Michael Porter was just coming off of an injury. Michael Porter Jr. had had a lot of lapses defensively over the course of his career. He was not playable down the stretch of playoff games at points because of the lack of defensive discipline. 
Bones Highland was also in a similar place, but way less talented. And the skill set didn't translate as well to winning basketball, especially when it mattered the most. So when I looked at these comments and I read them initially, when I when I described Michael Porter Jr. as a me guy, that didn't feel like a good uh, characterization of who he is as a player, at least what he's shown to be in Denver. And I think the commitment he's made to this team, it's, I was wondering, though, if he was talking about me guy as in because he's a shoot first player, like a score first player. Well, we know that he doesn't play make at a high level. He doesn't pass at a high level. So is that what he is talking about? That's what he's describing. Uh, and then on the other end of this is had MPJ shown some unwillingness historically where he wasn't willing to make some of those small adjustments to be a winning basketball player, whether it's defense, rebounding, hustle, whatever it might have been. I did not think that the the comments placed well, but also on top of that, I was wondering when Kevin O'Connor had this conversation with them, like what was the larger context of that individual conversation that even uh, would even elicit those kind of comments. So upon first read, didn't feel great. Thinking about the time period that they were in at that point in time, I wondered if they were just talking about two very young players coming into a year where they needed to solidify their roster about with guys that were about the team first. And maybe, again, because MPJ was young and because of what happened in some of his early career performances that he might have considered him somebody that was a a me first guy because of the shot profile or something like that. So, you know, I don't have a great, a really positive spin on it. I'm just trying to put context behind it, perhaps. Yeah, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to kill him for it. I think, um, one, this kind of happens when you have an outside rider that doesn't, that, and like I've done this. Like I've literally done, I've been in KOC spot before when I was with CBS and you satellite, you kind of drop in and you write this story and you don't understand some of the broader context. Um, like Bones uh, pitching it is like, oh, Bones was moved because he didn't fit right. Yeah, yeah but, but mm, Bones was moved because he was extremely mad about his position on the team and his opportunities and thought he was better than Jamal Murray and left the bench during a game. And the veterans were not too keen on that as they're trying to win a championship. And like Bones lost the locker room Mm. and that's okay. Like, I don't, they don't hold it against him. They still like him. They're still like, there will always be some love there. That's fine. Um, It was kind of pitched as like Malone versus Bones. And to be honest, from what I heard, the bigger problem was, was Bones and the rest of the locker room Um, because Bones is a young guy trying to make his way and he's trying to get paid. And again, like I've talked about this a lot. One of the reasons that the vibes are so copacetic on the Nuggets is nobody needs to get paid. When you have a young guy that's like trying to make his name so he can get that next contract, like Julian Strother can come in and just hit DHO threes and play defense. And guess what? That's his career. Like he's smart enough to know like that's his career. Bones Highland's path is very much like he needs to have the ball and he needs to be creating these highlight moments. And that's tough to do on a team trying to win a championship. Um, That's the Bones side. The MPJ side there's a lot of like, he was talking about him being a playmaker. Okay. But like Calvin Booth knows, like Calvin Booth know, understands the language of like a playmaker. He could have said like, we mm-hmm. needed somebody who could pass more. That's not included in this. And I have no reason to believe that KOC would purposely exclude that. If he did, then I, cause I've done that before. I'll say that again. I, I have, this is interesting for me to do. Cause like I've been in KOC spot where like, I will leave out like, Oh, I left out a sentence. Cause I didn't think it was meaningful. And then there was a whole like, thing about it and later i was like okay so here's like the unedited comments that i got for this quote right right but i will also say calvin hasn't you know calvin was an nba player for a long time so he understands the media side of it but he hasn't done like a lot of these interviews and i i do think there's a candidness here that is probably it's interesting it creates shows like this one right um i will just say that if mpj is upset about it because of how he interprets it I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. And this is like, again, never thought I'd be in this spot. Somebody commented like, we're about to see Matt defend Mike. Yup. Cause like MPJ backed everything up last year. He proved every, he proved himself and everything that he has said. Right. He has said constantly, I'm a winner. I'm willing to do what it takes to win. He learned the offense. He rebounded. He ran the floor and spotted up for three. He defended. He was not a liability on defense. Like, he did everything that was asked of him. Now, it is possible that MPJ behind scenes is like, that's different. One of the things I think is always interesting is when people ask, like, why is this guy continue to play when he's so bad in games? 
the answer is often he's great in practice and the coaches see that. And so they're like, I have all of these instances of him in practice versus him in the game. And some coaches tend to lean a little bit more on the practice stuff. So my point here is just that like maybe MPJ behind the scenes is like a little bit of a diva. Like, you know, Deandre Jordan's always kind of giving him grief about various things, just like ribbing him um, playfully. Like there's a lot of love there, but like, I don't, I don't blame MPJ if, when this gets clipped and aggregated and it comes across it, it, when somebody brings it in, in front of him, if he's a little bit like annoyed, do you think he has a conversation with Booth about this? I, I, I would imagine, I would imagine Calvin probably reaches out and texts him and it's just like, Hey, this is what I meant. Um, right. That's usually how these things are handled. But part of that though, is as an NBA player, it's your obligation not to, and how can I put it? It's your kind of your obligation not to entirely trust the front office. Like this is what makes it really complicated is, and this is honestly, I think something that Tim Conley really struggled with is like, he wanted to have strong relationships with guys. He does. He continues to have strong relationships with guys, but that's difficult because you also have to be very cold blooded in your assessments of these dudes at times and what it takes to win a championship. Um, I don't think this is going to be like a major deal. However, for somebody that has talked a little bit about how like the, you know, Bill Simmons talks about the disease of me and like all these kind of ideas of, you know, what happens after a championship and, and how big a part egos. Like I can't sit here and talk about how often the egos interfere in the NBA and then be like, Oh, but not here. Yeah. No, that doesn't, that doesn't happen here in Denver. You're going to see that a lot. Cause everyone feels that way, but like so do you, as, do you as think selfless that, as everyone is here, there's that's still going to be a part of this team going forward. It's still an NBA team. So do you think this is a teaching moment for Booth then that it's not about having diplomacy, but even if maybe a little bit more shrewdness in how you're communicating? Could it, you know it could have been Matt? You know who who knows how long they were talking for? This could have been hour two, and he's feeling himself. Maybe a couple, uh, you know. You know, Mike's hard lemonades or, you know, some Arnold Palmer's or something like that. You've just been sitting there, you've been talking, and then you're just having the conversation. And right. then at some point in time, you just get a little bit more loose with your language. And then that becomes the thing. You know, I used to, you know, and when I, I've done public speaking my whole life, and one of the things that people have told me is that it's not the stuff you mean to say that gets you in trouble. It's the offhanded comments you didn't in, mean to say that gets you in trouble because you don't actually think through some of that stuff. So do you think then for Calvin Booth that this is something that, he looks at and says, this comment does more damage than anything it could have done good, and I just don't need to communicate this kind of thing anymore. Do you think that this changes the way he even interacts uh, in terms of answering questions with media at all? Depends on, on what's made out of it. Depends on how big of a story it becomes, right? Mm. Um, if it's just us, it's no big deal because it's just local coverage and it's fine. Um, right. You know, I will say that like most GMs, like they really don't screw with a lot of this stuff. That's why they they prefer not to comment on most things. Like I can't tell you how many times I've written a story on a. There's there's three teams in particular that I know pretty well and have done stories on several times, and I know people in their front office, but their front office is very much like, yeah, we'll tell you stuff, but we're absolutely not going on record because they don't they don't want to take any credit away from the players and they don't want situations where their comments are misinterpreted and then it causes rifts because things are so sensitive. Right. Um, like Kyle mentions in here, Kyle says folks blowing this out of proportion because they need the season to start for real. I don't know. Kyle, like Kyle, I disagree with you. Uh, if this story came out the first week of the season, we'd still be doing the show on it because these are really insightful views into how the franchise is built. And I'm sorry, but like MPJ is a $100 million player on multiple back surgeries who literally committed himself to doing all of the things that it's hard for players in his position to do. Like mm -hmm. the sacrifice that he made last year has to be respected. Yeah. I think in these conversations, and I'm not saying that, that Booth doesn't respect him because I think he does. Right. I, I, it's entirely possible this was a playmaker conversation, and that's fine. Matt, let me can I ask you a question, brother? So you remember uh, Media Day? Remember when uh, Calvin Booth said that there are three alphas on the roster? You remember who he mentioned? Did he mention Mike or was it AG? Booth. I don't remember. No, it was Aaron Gordon. Yeah. The that that's see that's the thing. It's like with these comments, with that comment, it 
do you feel that is there is there something if there's something a little bit different do you think with these kind of comments that there's just something even organizationally internally where they even view maybe not they but maybe Calvin do they do view Mike or he view Mike kind of he's a part of the core four but he's not as like entrenched in the big three and therefore like I'm a little bit more loose with some of the things I might say because I can guarantee I don't feel like he would say something like this about Jamal or about Jokic or obviously Aaron Gordon, but he doesn't Aaron Gordon that have the game that even translate like that because we've seen him sacrifice when he came here. So do you feel like MPJ just has a different kind of existence in the Nuggets organization from those players? Yeah, I always think it's weird when like it's talked about the big three. So, like some there are literally I've heard like references like to, oh the Nuggets three stars. Uh, Jokic, Jamal, and MPJ. And like, I'll see fans do it. Well, they'll talk about, it, and I'm just like, guys, it's Aaron Gordon. Like, it's, it's those, like, th- there are those three. And then, oh, yeah, also Mike. And that's okay. And again, Mike was an integral part of them winning a championship, right? It's just like a different level of impact. What I do kind of wonder is, like, this might be an ongoing kind of struggle of there's, like, if I was MPJ, I would, I would want the ball more. I would want a bigger role. Like I would be like, look, I did all this sacrifice. I did all these things. Like, can't I have do my thing too? Like I can make us better. I'm a really great scorer. Uh, And if you're the nuggets, you're like, we really just need you to rebound and shoot. Like, that's what we need. Like that makes us perfect. And maintaining that balance, that equilibrium long-term when you have as much talent as MPJ does I think it's still going to continue to be a little bit of a challenge. No, I even, but again, the only person I think with that skill set, Matt, that you could get away with doing that with is somebody who had three back surgeries in their life that had to rely yeah. on getting yeah. re ingratiated with playing basketball. Because guess yeah. what? If you had another six foot 10, uber talented player like this, you couldn't get away with putting them in a role spot because those players don't exist as role players. But MBJ, he bought in because he had to rebuild his life and rebuild his career, getting back surgery. But look, but again, but Matt, there's only so there's only so many times you can play with somebody's name. And again, that depends on how he feels about it. But again, yeah. I just think that like it's a very precarious situation. Well, we could talk about this, but if MPJ is like, no, it's totally fine. I know what Calvin meant. I'm not right. worried about it. We have a great relationship. If Calvin's like, yeah, no, I'm not worried about it. I know right. MPJ knows how I feel about him. It doesn't right. really matter what we think. This is the thing about winning a championship. You get to pretty much ignore any any sort of these conversations. It's an interesting discussion. But right now, all we're really kind of reacting to is a quote. Uh, speaking of quotes, on the other side, uh, he had he, Calvin also had an interesting thing to say about Bruce Brown and, and, and Peyton Watson and their relative impacts. We'll talk about that on the other side on Locked on Nuggets. First, let's talk about game time. Game start next week. You're going to have Nuggets home games here. Got Avs games already going. Whew, what a that shootout was so tense the other night with the Avs. Uh, you, you're going to be able to get into Broncos games probably at a really great price over the rest of the season. So there's a lot of opportunities for you to catch live events. And you can do so with Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You're not going to catch any bad sight lines or a pillar in your way. All in prices show your total upfront, so you know you're getting a great deal without the hidden fees. This is huge. I go ballistic when I'm like, okay, it costs this much. And then you get to the checkout page and you're like, the heck you mean this is 40 more dollars? I get really mad at those. Never happens with game times. And you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on MBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and use redeem code locked on NBA, L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We'll be right back on Locked on Nuggets. Back here on Locked on Nuggets, final segment here for you on a Tuesday, hanging out with Swipa. I'm Matt Moore. Appreciate you guys being with us. So uh, the last kind of comment from this article, and it just as a heads up, my thanks to Calvin Booth for providing an article that gave us an entire show's worth in, after a preseason game, because otherwise I'd just be sitting on here being like, yeah, Julian Strother's good. And that's like, <laughs> I feel like I've said Julian Strother's good a lot. Uh, so a little bit of a, of a thing there. Um 
let's hear the quotes regarding Bruce Brown. Um, that blow was big, Booth admitted, talk about both Bruce Brown and Jeff Green. The Nuggets dabbed in pursuing veteran free agents, but Booth decided against it to avoid taking minutes away from young players. That decision may make Malone's job harder in the short term, but it could lead to greater returns down the line. Malone said Brown will fill Brown 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 will fill Brown's <laughs> former role, and he could be even better after working all summer to improve his spot up jumper and his ball handling when bringing the ball up the floor. Brown himself thinks Peyton Watson could also be in for a big season after watching him from the be bench. Uh, talks about those kind of things, but here's a big quote from from Booth: uh, Some of these teams were trying to get Bruce, trying to make it, trying to get Bruce, trying to make it worth it. It's like just be careful what you wish for. That's a weird quote. Uh, Booth said about the rivals that pursued Brown. He said, quote, Peyton's bigger. He's longer. He's more athletic. He guards better. He passes better. He doesn't have the experience and he's not as good offensively yet, but we need defense more than we need offense on our team. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Peyton Watson's a better passer than Bruce Brown. Uh, Peyton Watson's a better defender right now. Brown, uh, Calvin. It's well known that that Calvin Booth is the guy that like, he Peyton Watson is his dude, right? Mm -hmm. Took Christian Brown. It was a value pick. He wound up contributing to a finals run. It was a great pick. He's going to be a, a twelve year player. Peyton Watson is like is like the guy for for Calvin Booth. He believes in Peyton Watson. Traded up to get him. Mm -hmm. Believes in him. Has basically removed any obstacle from Peyton playing. Uh, this season in the front court. Uh, what was your reaction to those particular comments regarding Bruce and Peyton's impact? Matt, let me, can I try to like contextualize this a little bit from what I felt sure. when I first read that? So I was actually way more comfortable with these comments than I were anything about Michael Porter Jr. And well, the reason being is when he, again, this is me reading into the comments, when he said like almost like buyer beware, I don't think he was shading anything at Bruce. I think what he was actually doing was saying that if you think you're taking Bruce away from this roster, well, okay. But that means that this dude, this six foot eight super freak that we have, he gave, it was like a wrestling buildup. You know, when Chris Jericho gets on the mic and he's building up the next person that's about to come down the ring. This is what it felt like. Now you thought, you thought that you, you saw something in Bruce Brown, but, but Peyton Watson, it's a six foot eight better version than what we have with Bruce Brown. And so if you want to go ahead and overpay him by giving $22.5 million to Bruce Brown uh, for one year and then possible 45 for two, then guess what? We got this dude named Peyton Watson that's just waiting in the reins. And guess what? When his opportunity comes, he's going to be even better because he's bigger, more athletic, and more defensively skilled than Bruce Brown is. And so for me, I didn't feel like he was sliding Bruce because I've heard him talk about Bruce. What it felt like is he's big up in Peyton, and he's saying, look, y'all can take him off the roster, but we got a better version of him sitting right here at home. Yeah, I mean, the key word here, you're absolutely right, because the key word here is Booth said about, like, be careful what you wish for. Booth said about the rivals that pursued Brown. Right. The Indiana Pacers are not a rival of the Denver Nuggets. The Los Angeles Lakers are. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> like you know, in the current context. And so... Like, this is literally just like the Lakers made a big show of trying to get Bruce because right. to be honest, like Bruce was really awesome in the conference finals, him going coast to coast in those fullback dives I talked about were game right. changers for the Nuggets in that series. It lifted those second units. When you're losing the bench minutes, if you're losing the non Nicola minutes, you're doomed. And they kept losing those minutes because of what Bruce is bringing to the table. Um, so like, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I kind of get that. Like, Here's an example. Uh, Anthony Irwin, who runs a Lakers pod, Lakers Lounge, um, friend of the program. Adam was just on his on, on Lakers Lounge. Uh, he he literally told me that he thinks that if Bruce Brown was on the Lakers instead of the Nuggets, they win that series. Man, closest and sweep in like, NBA history, Matt Moore. I was like, I I don't know, man. You got you got sweat. I know this the games were tight, but I don't know that Bruce Brown is like a 28 point flip. If you look at the overall total, it's number. not like LeBron and Anthony Davis couldn't shot make down the stretch or anything. Yeah, it's not great. So anyway, 
Um, I don't want <laughs> I don't want to get in the Lakers stuff again. We're gonna have enough of that next week. But I will say that I get what he's saying. I I I'm just a little bit concerned of Peyton is being very much set up as a pendulum here where it's like he he's the way this presents it is he's got to be that level of player again he's lo- he's bigger he's longer he's more athletic check 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 no question right he guards better okay uh i think Peyton's really good defensively and makes a lot of plays in terms of like being able to block shots Bruce has done some pretty amazing stuff in terms of positional defense and being really smart and navigating stuff like he's extremely court aware but okay i can even get there uh, he passes better. I'm blown away by that comment. And that's, I'm not going to be like, what are you crazy? I, it's Calvin Booth, right? His entire job was to evaluate talent and he built a championship team. So maybe I got to go back and like watch Peyton Watson's passing. Hey, somewhere. turn on the Houston Rockets game when he was going court to court. You'll see it. You'll see the passing displayed right there. Yeah. And maybe that's it. Maybe he, maybe he really is a better passer um, than Bruce. He doesn't have the experience and he's not as good offensively yet, but we need defense more than we need offense on our team. That's absolutely true. Um, You do need just, just stack it. I I think it's interesting based off of, you know, Adam and I did the show last night and we were doing stock watch and like Peyton's a little bit or this morning rather. And Peyton's a little bit down for us. Like he's a little bit lower than expectations. And so I think, yeah, hit me. Wouldn't you say until the Warriors game that a certain somebody named Christian Brown was also a little lower on the stock watch? Because he hadn't hit any shots in preseason whatsoever. Last year? Yeah. Remember in preseason, he hadn't hit any of his shots. And then versus Utah, didn't get a lot of playing time. And it wasn't until that Jordan Poole strip in the second half of the Warriors game, and he went coast to coast, that everything started to kind of flip because the POA defense was on full display in that game. I have to think about it. I don't remember, so I'm not going to like claim it. Maybe I was right, right. like, "Ooh, yeah, Christian Brown may not be very good." Maybe I was there. It felt very early, like it was like, "Hey, Christian seems like he knows what he's doing." Yeah. Um, that to me is the bigger thing. Is that Christian felt like he like felt comfortable on the floor, and there's still some times where I feel like Pwat is not as comfortable uh, in some of the, the sets that are being run. But we'll see yeah. kind of how it goes. I just think it's an interesting kind of uh, setup, and and I think the biggest thing is just look. I'm, I have said this, how many times have we did this? We went into like four seasons of like Jamal Murray's the most important player this season for the Nuggets. And then it was uh, MPJ. And then it was, it was honestly Zeke there for a little bit, right? Of like, this has got to be a Zeke season. They, he's got to come through. And he didn't. Like you you can get around that and find other options. But right now, the way this roster is being positioned and the way Calvin Booth talks about him, Peyton Watson's got to be great. Like he needs to be great in at some point in the future. And that's very clear that their, their roster assumptions are built around that. I think. Well, I think, I think it feels like to me, Matt, that Peyton Watson has the Jaden McDaniels archetype in terms of skill set. And there's a particular place that Jaden McDaniel belongs in the roster with the comes to the Minnesota Timberwolves. He's a starter. He's the best wing defender in the NBA basically right now. And I think that I think he thinks of Peyton Watson as being able to step into that small sport forward spot and kind of be that player in between Joker and Jamal at some point in time. But again, that stuff takes a lot of development. Now, I will say this. Peyton Watson is aware of what has been said about him, uh, the support he has from Booth and from other players in the NBA. He 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 yeah. respects it and he believes in it. And so I would say if Peyton Watson is responding to this in every way that you want a player to respond to this by accepting the challenge and willing to do the hard things to be a successful player. Even when he talks about his role with the Nuggets, he wants to be someone who does the right thing and to prove his worth to the starters and to the coaching staff. So I think his brain and his his mental fortitude right now seems to be of a person that says that I, I hear the noise, I hear the love and, and adoration that I get from my teammates and from the coaches and from the front office, and I want to do my best to be the very best version of myself for this team. I like that. That's good perspective. That's good perspective, Swipa. All right. That's going to do it for Locked On Nuggets. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us. I'll be back tomorrow. Swipa will have you uh, tomorrow night or the next day for the Wednesday show. Have yourselves a great week. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you guys again next time on Locked On Nuggets.